In your reading about rock crystal in the Islamic tradition, you would have seen one of these photos and uh, read briefly about early rock crystal lamps prior to the Islamic period. So these are works that were made uh, in the Near East prior to the rise of Islam. So prior to about uh, the 6th century, 6th, 7th century CE. Uh, this is a fish-shaped lamp and you can see it reflects that traditional association between rock crystal and water by depicting uh, a fish. And then of course it takes advantage of the light magnifying properties of rock crystal to be used as a lamp. And as I understand this lamp would have been used, of course, uh, any open flame would have been particularly dangerous and hanging open flames were especially dangerous. But what they would do is they would fill the basin that you see here on the underside of the fish with water and then there would be a thin film of oil on the top and that's what would actually be lit. Uh, you could also have sort of a vial of oil inside of uh, a basin of water. And so the idea is, is if this gets knocked down, the water is going to extinguish the flame, thus preventing a, a very dangerous fire situation. Here's another early lamp. And here we have uh, sort of a bowl shape of rock crystal with projecting relief sculpture, that is sculpture that is attached to the surface that it's on as opposed to sculpture in the round. And these sculptures depict fish and shellfish. So I think you can see the spiraled shell uh, that is just slightly to the left of center. To the left of that, you can see the tail and part of a fish that's kind of turning on one side of the lamp. And then there are other sea creatures projecting on this. Um, this particular uh, lamp is set within a later gold frame that would have originally had jewels on it. Um, and like the previous lamp, these are both in the treasury of San Marco in Venice. Uh, I was given the permission to photograph there, which is kind of unusual. I was very lucky. Um, but this, again, kind of continues in that association between rock crystal, pure water, uh, celestial water, and light. And that's something that we're going to see taken over by the Islamic religion and pushed in a very particular way, just the way that the Christians used similar associations between light and water and rock crystal in their works of art, and particularly purity in rock crystal. Just briefly, here's another view of that same lamp, um, except we're looking at it at a, about a 90 degree angle from where we were before. And here you can see that fish I was talking about uh, directly ahead of us. So it is uh, kind of swimming upside down, it looks like, with its tail out. And apparently some lamps were actually uh, placed as bowls upside down. I'm not exactly sure precisely how these worked, but this one might have been used that way originally. And then as you, as you know, uh, it is now in a later framework and you can see that framework a little bit better in this slide. Here's an actual Islamic lamp. And uh, this one was not made for a mosque, but it was in fact made for a royal patron. And the inscription uh, in Arabic around the top of it refers to the patron and wealth and prosperity. Uh, again, the, the framework holding this is much later. It was brought to Venice and turned into a vessel for the church, a covered uh, cup. Um, but here you can see, again, that wonderful clarity of the rock crystal. You can see, uh, I think you can appreciate just how expensive this work must have been because it's an almost flawless piece of rock crystal with only a few small imperfections running through it. Um, and you can, I, I think you can appreciate when you look at the details that I have on the right, 
the the almost liquid quality of this very hard brittle material in the video interviews that you watched with me discussing techniques with Elise Morero, uh, an, archaeolog or an experimental archaeologist at Oxford, one of the things that she was describing was the way that uh, rock crystal ewers, which is what we're going to be looking at next, were formed. And uh, once the general overall shape of the ewer was formed, then it would be drilled into to uh, start to hollow out the actual vessel. And so the, the slightly blurry um, diagram that I have on the left shows you how a tubular drill, and this could be something as simple as sort of a copper pipe that you would get at Lowe's or Home Depot today, uh, would be used to uh, drill a, a tubular, o tubular opening into a large piece of rock crystal. At the top right, what you're seeing are actual examples of tubular drills used in India in the rock cutting industry there. And then the diagram that you see on the right shows a tubular drill being used. And what you need to know is that it's not the metal that's doing the work here, but instead it is some sort of a grinding abrasive powder. And uh, in the Islamic world, uh, in the 10th century CE, when works like this were being made, that could have been something as simple as sand, which is silica, uh, or it could have been something a little harder, like corundum, which is uh, a type of garnet. Um, it's possible, perhaps, that they could have used diamond powder. Uh, that's really more of a modern grinding medium. Um, and in fact, in her experiments researching the techniques, uh, Elise Morero actually tried different types of grinding powders uh, and was able to identify the marks of different types of powders used for both grinding and polishing. And so that's why I listed the three possibilities of uh, sand, corundum, or a diamond powder. Historically, and even today, artists tend to be very frugal about their materials, particularly when they're expensive. And in the Islamic world, we have no exception. The, the Fatimid uh, crystal workers who made works like the Ewers we're going to see took those tubular cores and used them to make smaller vessels. And that's what I'm showing you here. Uh, in the center and right of this particular slide. Um, they would make little bottles out of those tubular pieces that were cut out of larger vessels. And those in turn would be uh, drilled with a tubular drill and then you would get something that could turn into an even smaller bottle or possibly a bead for jewelry. The central bottle is uh, very much like the, the types of bottles that you might purchase uh, in Fatimid Egypt back in the middle of, of the, the 10th century. And on the right, you can see uh, another such example. And here, it's been incorporated into a reliquary cross in a German treasury. A lot of the surviving vessels that we have from Fatimid Egypt were brought into uh, Western treasuries uh, a lot, in many cases by crusaders. Sometimes they were given as gifts. Uh, sometimes they were souvenirs from people who traveled widely and then purchased them and gave them later to churches. Um, but these were considered precious in the Christian tradition because of all of those associations with rock crystal and they were reused. Here's a great few views of one of those uh, rock crystal bottles. And I'm showing you some detailed views of it so that you can see uh, where the core of it was drilled out. You can get a sense from my fingers here in my gloves that it's uh, slightly thicker than a human thumb. 
Um, and so you could actually get a much smaller bottle, one that might be sort of pinky finger sized out of uh, the core from this. And then from that small bottle, you might be able to take cores and cut them into beads. Uh, you can also see some of the really delicate carving on this particular bottle. And I want you to recall what Elise was telling us about the ways that these, these uh, pieces would be cut. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Here are two of the rock crystal ewers that belong to a group of rock crystals from Fatima, Egypt, that are considered the Magnificent Seven. They are of unparalleled workmanship. And take a look at these. Each one of them stands about 10 inches tall and is just worked with so much precision and detail. You have relief that strongly stands out from the, the, the surface behind it. Uh, you have really elaborate scroll work and designs. The piece on the left that you see is in the Louvre Museum uh, in Paris, and it came into the treasury of Saint-Denis, uh, a very wealthy abbey church outside of Paris, um, probably in the, the 12th or 13th century. The piece on the right is in the treasury of San Marco in Venice and most likely came to Venice during the Crusades. We're looking at a third ewer here. This one's in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. And on the right, I have a diagram that Elise Morero made showing uh, what would have been sort of the first working version of something like this. Um, initially, the uh, rock crystal artist would have cut the cut and and drilled into the rock crystal on the surface, sort of the general areas that would be raised up in relief against the, the regular surface of the ewer. So these are the so-called eyelets that stand proud of the surface of the crystal and stick out a little bit more. I hope this slide maybe clarifies things for you and you might want to go back and re-watch uh, some of the video clips with Elise Morero discussing these techniques after you finish this video. Here's a close-up I made of the ewer that's in San Marco in Venice, and I just want you to notice how much we have, uh, the, here we're looking at sort of the feet and the tail of that lion um, on the ewer, and I want you to notice how much that projects from the surface of the crystal. So we truly do have some fairly high relief, and then that's carved into using a grinding wheel uh, to give dots and lines and, and show areas of contour and pattern on that uh, particular lion. We're back to the general view of the ewer in San Marco in Venice and a detail view showing the head of that lion. And again, you can see just the, the sheer quality of workmanship here and all of the fine details. And just imagine the, the difficulty and the, the expertise that this would have required because uh, we're talking about, again, an incredibly brittle medium, one that uh, is very hard to find in these really nice sized chunks that are uh, really, really clear and without uh, many major imperfections in them. Uh, this particular piece of crystal is really brilliantly clear. Um, and one wrong move and the entire thing would be lost. I always think about how many failures the, the artist must have uh, encountered along the way before he or she became a master of this material. This is the last example that we're going to look at, and this is another ewer that is also in San Marco in Venice, and it's also part of that group called the Magnificent Seven. Uh, this particular one features rams on it. And I want to uh, make a little note here about how these objects would have functioned. Um, 
as far as we can tell from the inscriptions on these surviving ewers, uh, many of which do have inscriptions, these were meant for royal use. So they probably would have been used to hold water or wine or some other type of liquid. And uh, again, that association between liquid and light and crystal would come into play in that case. Um, and of course, the, the wonderful qualities that rock crystal has when responding to color. Um, of course, in the Christian world, when works like this were captured or brought into uh, church treasuries by whatever means, these would be used as precious vessels to hold substances like holy oil, possibly wine for communion, possibly holy water, and also uh, in the case particularly of the smaller vessels, uh, small pieces of the saints uh, called relics. Um, and relics were very, very important to the Christian tradition in the Middle Ages. We're going to close with just some closer looks at this ram uh, on this ewer. I want you to notice all of the linear detail that decorates this relief image of a ram. You can see lines delineating the horns, giving us a sense of fuzzy hair on the muzzle and on the chin, dots giving us the impression of uh, curly wool on the body, for example. And we also have similar lines on some of the plant forms. Here in this detail, we've zoomed in even a little bit closer, and this is uh, that plant form kind of close to the ram's head. And what I'm showing you in the detail view is a microscopic image uh, that was made when uh, Elise Morero was doing her research. And in it, you can see uh, the how the grinding wheel was used to cut these lines. And some of that overlap uh, you can see is just a product of using uh, a wheel of a particularly of a particular depth or breadth um, when grinding. I hope you appreciate these amazing vessels as much as I do. I think they're truly spectacular.